And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart. This is a story of strength and redemption that begins with me meeting a young man named Billy. And Billy uh, had a metal leg, but I didn't pay attention to that. We were at the pool. I noticed that he had a pin sticking out of his finger. And I walked up to him and said, I want to take a look at your hand and try not to throw up. Now, his thought with that was, that's an interesting approach. I haven't been greeted with that before. <laughs> so when I was a little boy, I had a pin on my finger too, and I wanted to be, I wanted to look in the face of the thing that scared me. So he said, well, why don't we go do a Tough Mudder together? Now, a Tough Mudder is a wonderful and terrible idea. It's 10 miles long with military obstacles. He says, let's go. Let's come up with a team name. So I came up with the worst idea of team names I think I could come up with, hoping that he would say, no, let's not do this. So I said, we'll be Team Nubs and Stubs. He goes, great. <laughs> I'll make a T-shirt. So we had this T-shirt, and he took the perfect man of, like, you know, the guy that's standing out with the arms and legs and all that. He took that Da Vinci man, and he, he, he cut the leg off and the fingers and the hands. And so that was our guy. So there were 17 of us, and that was on the 12th of, no, sorry, the 27th of October, 2012. There were 17 of us, and we completed that race. And at the bottom of the shirt, I, we, I added, like, to soften it a bit, said, has more heart than scars. When, when the Boston bombing took place, we decided to change the name to more heart than scars. And we wanted to change our focus to let people know that we've recently injured that their lives were not going to be limited by the scars that they carried. And so we went on a quest to reach out. So today we're going to talk about questions, quest, obstacles, resilience, and interdependence, fit, faith, love, hope, and heart. It begins with a question. When I was 12 years old, I'm in that picture there. You can't see that I'm ugly crying. There's a lot of snot coming out of my nose. Uh, there's, there's a little bit of blood on my fingers because I was holding on so tightly. Uh, my legs are shaking. I probably peed a little bit. I threw up, too. And so because when I was eight years old, and it makes sense, I was eight years old, and I was up on the top of a treehouse, and I tied a rope around myself, and I was going to jump off like in those movies and be like a mountain man. And I jumped back. Great. And then I didn't tie the rope correctly, and I fell 20 feet and broke my arm. So I'm there, and I'm nervous. And you can think, well, that's reasonable for him to be scared. But more than that, the camp counselor said to me, you're safe. You're holding on to a cable, and cables are strong. But that didn't give me any peace at all. When I was 10 years old, I was visiting my grandparents. And my grandmother has a piece of adaptive equipment that she used. To, she would roll into her wheelchair at the top of a steep hill to get down to her house. And it was like the size of a picnic table. She'd roll in, ride down the track. The engine was at the bottom, and she'd roll out. Well, of course, I was going to play with that thing. So I did. In fact, I was a big fan of Superman. And, you know, faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive. So what I did is I got down real low, and I grabbed onto the cable. And I scooted up as far as I could, because as a 10-year-old, I figured it'd be bad to be run over. So I pulled hand over hand, and I leaned back just a little bit, and the cable and the pulley met and fed my fingers around. I screamed to my friend to stop. He turned it off and ran off, and now I'm stuck. They were pinched. They were not severed all the way. So I had to pull as hard as I could to tear these fingers free, and then I tried to get up here, but there wasn't enough torque. I couldn't get up, so I had to grab onto my wrist and stand up and turn and break my radius and my ulna to pull my hand free. So now I'm at this high ropes course, and I am losing my mind. And Bernie Miller, the camp counselor guy, didn't understand any of that. He didn't understand about trauma. He hadn't been through a trauma training. He wasn't a counselor. He was just a young man that decided to show up and care and kindly and more lovingly talked me through it. Well, I finished that day. And then next year I came back, I didn't pee in my pants at all when I did it. By the time I'm 19, I'm working at Camp Mondamin up on that very same obstacle, helping other kids get through it. So it's got to begin with a question. And that question is, do you have more heart than scars? That's when I got to answer it for myself. See, we don't know how much time we have left. And so that clock is ticking, and yet 
we have the option to feed our fears. We could feed our fears, feed despair, feed all the negative things, but there's a scale of balance. And you really find out at the end of your life, maybe you're there, maybe you're not, but at the end of your life, people are going to walk away from your funeral, and that's the walk away that you know if this person had more heart than scars or not. People that walk away with hope and joy, and there's a legacy. So out of it, it wasn't easy for me at that point with my hands. Just because I got through and faced my fear didn't mean I was all done. In fact, it started a lot of uh, addiction and alcohol and drugs to, to deal with the feelings of that. And so that went on for years, but I eventually did get sober because I made a choice to live differently. All right, we know who this guy is, so we're going to have some little participation here, all right? I'm going to point at you. You come back, all right? <laughs> okay. We will, we will. Fuck you. All right. At Freddie Mercury, when, right now, somewhere in America, people are stomping their feet, clamping their hands together, and it's saying, we will rock you. They're not thinking about how Freddie Mercury died. They're thinking about maybe Wayne's World or, well, you know, a great song. They're thinking about their champions, but they're not thinking about how he was gone. And it's a legacy, and that comes on. So this next person, I'm going to say a couple words to you, and I need you to give the words back to me. He cooked up with a guy with a more space-like flair. So ground control to Major Tom. Yeah, Bowie. When you think of Bowie, you don't go, oh, that poor unfortunate guy died of cancer. He didn't tell anybody he had cancer. He was finishing his last album. He had stuff to do. When Bowie got together with Freddie Mercury, they came up with what I think is the greatest song ever, which is Under Pressure. And Bowie sings out, he says, you know, it's the terror of knowing what this world is about, watching some good friends scream, let me out. And Mercury comes back later in the song, says, why can't we give love another chance? Why can't we give love, give love, give love, give love? And Bowie says, because love's such an old-fashioned word. And love dares us to care for the people living on the edge of the night. And love dares us to change the way that we care for ourselves, because this is our last dance. This is ourselves under pressure. This next thing, you have to really participate well with me on here, and don't jump ahead, <laughs> all right? You're going to be tempted to. Some people think there might have been a licensing disagreement about this one song and the next, but Harold, just hold on. When I point, participate, please. T -t 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 -t. Yo, VIP. All right, stop. Collaborate. Ice is back with a brand new invention. Something grabs a hold of me tightly, flowing like a harpoon daily and nightly. Yo, I don't know. Turn up the mic and I'll glow. To the extreme, I rock the mic like a vandal. Light up the stage, I'll wax a chump like a candle. Dance. All right, so Vanilla Ice, that happened at a TED Talk. Let's just have that moment. So today is National Suicide, not national, it's Worldwide Suicide Prevention Day. And after that hit, hit the world, he took it so hard that he actually tried to end his life. In my life, I've also, you know, I've struggled with suicidal ideation and attempts. And here's that moment where, you know, it's that terror of knowing what the world is about. So there's so much stigma, a fear to ask for help. So I'm going to ask you to participate again. And the way this is going to go is if your life has been impacted by the loss to someone to suicide, on the count of three, just cry out the word help. One, two, three. Help. And that's the struggle. We asked people to go on a quest. If they're leaving the cave, like in the allegory of the cave where people are shackled to shadows and their whole life they're stuck, if you want to wake up, you have to wake up and leave the cave. Going on that cave is a quest, not like a mission statement, but an absolute imperative that I'm willing to live and die for. If you're willing to go on the quest, immediately you come up with, maybe I could just stay back in the cave. And we have these new shiny devices in our hands that now have the shadows not on the walls but in our hands. You think, well, maybe I'm going to get into a really healthy relationship or learn something new or do whatever, or I could just watch it in my hand. You need the tools to make it. So when you go on a quest, it's not until you go on the quest, it's not until you leave the cave and you're, you're committed that magically, miraculously, the things show up. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, when they're about to do battle... Father Christmas shows up and gives Peter a sword and a shield and gives Susan a bow and arrow and Lucy a little vial of healing potion and uh, a dagger. So that really hit me as a kid. I was thinking, well, maybe, maybe one day I'll be a knight. 
So obstacles. That's Jessie. The first time we did our team, we had 17 people. As she's going over the corral to start this race here in Asheville, there was 550 people in that corral. And when the MC would cry out, more heart, the whole crowd would scream back than scars. All day, 7,000 people passing us as we're going by, saying more heart than scars. It is an obstacle that, sure, because, of the repair, because she deals with being paralyzed, it's a different experience, but she's an equal member of our team when we go through it. We're not helping her, we're helping each other. So it's just another obstacle, and that can be a metaphor. For some people, it's getting out of bed. For some people, it's doing the laundry, taking their medications, going to a meeting. Right here is uh, Blind Pete. We call him Blind Pete because he's blind and his name is Pete. <laughs> he's uh, repelling there. Don't worry, I got his back. Remember that expert repeller that fell 25 feet is right behind him. <laughs> so this is a Spartan Agogi race event. It's a 60-hour deal. And with that, we uh, were able to you know, compete with like five different adaptive athletes, and we ended up in Outside Magazine online. This is my best friend, Michael Mills. And Michael right there is attached to a rope that goes for 100 yards, and he's attached to a big car that weighs 5,000 pounds. And as he pulls hand over hand, that harness pulls him forward, and he set that world record. Resilience means, I got this. How resilience works in a, in a study First of all, you face down reality. My hands were stuck. I had to get free. I had to search for meaning in my life to make these hands that were injured to heal other people. And I have to continually improvise. Michael and I figured out 100 different ways to do that until we finally got it done. Maurice Vanderpool did a study that found about people that were survivors of the Holocaust. And he realized they had a, a plastic shield. Ours is leather and steel. But his plastic shield was a sense of humor, usually a dark sense of humor to be able to laugh at oneself and to laugh at the struggles. Also, that shield helped people to hold and firm you know, attachments, to connect to others. Who are your band of brothers and sisters? Who, who's got your shield wall? Who are you next and attaching to? And ultimately, you had to develop a psychological space to protect your inner heart, because even the people that are there beside you struggling could stab you in the back, too. Because hurt people hurt people. But to find the attachments to move to the big point of interdependence. No matter how difficult and pokey that our friends may be, we need each other. In fact, a 75-year study that from out of Harvard uh, by George Valant, he wrote in his book, Adaption to Life, he said that the reliable presence of people who love us facilitates our perception and tolerance of painful realities and enriches our lives. He ultimately says relationships are the beginning, the middle, and the end. It is love. Back to, can you give love, give love? Bernie, showing up with the camp counselor, that love helped me get through what I needed to. So after you have interdependence, then what it really comes down is maintenance, which is about being fit. Joe DeSena is the guy who started Spartan races, and his whole idea was to rip people off the couches and make them uncomfortable on purpose so they'd be more resilient. And he said this, daily training and a lifestyle of fitness makes life easy. This is a guy who gets up early, early in the morning, does works out crazy, takes a cold shower, and gets off for his day. He said training and fitness helps build resilience, helps build connections with other people that are like-minded, and helps you learn to accept the daily grind as just part of the job we all have to do on earth. If you're taking care of your body, if you're being mindful, if you're eating the foods that you need to do, then you can be fit. What's important is this model is this shield is that shield that blocks and protects. But on the inside is the wheel. This is actually a wheelchair wheel on the outside of it. And it turns and builds momentum. Ask the question, do I have more heart than scars? Go on a quest that the world hears it and says it back to me. So they can see themselves not as victims, but as victorious. The obstacles, we train for obstacles, both the metaphor and the real ones. We develop resilience and become interdependent and we work on that fitness. So, back to Santa. <laughs> so why am I really wearing this? Well, some people could say, well, are you just playing around? And the answer is, this sword and this shield are the gifts and the tools that are given to me that we ask to knight people. And we say to them, do you have more faith than fear? And Justin Falls, flying the plane, he has his doctorate in pharmacology, he has more faith than fear. 
He also set the world record for being a quadriplegic, completing several races all over the place. We first met at the Renaissance Festival. I asked him to joust. He was dressed like Burger King. He's taken being a knight very seriously. Do you have more love than hate? Wendy Pabin, the co-founder of More Heart Than Scars, as a little girl, her mother's boyfriend sexually abused her for years. And with that, she, he punished her about food and made her feel terrible about who she was. She decided to fight that fight and to forgive herself, to forgive him, and to love herself. And she teaches other people to love themselves as now as a counselor, helping them to face their invisible scars. Chris Davis has more hope than despair. He is the rock for me. He's gained weight, lost weight, gained weight, and still continues to struggle and carry the real burdens, which it can be depression. So his brother just recently had committed suicide, and that's the idea that we're trying to have more hope than despair, that we ask for help with, for one another. This gentleman right here, John Powers, we did races together. His nickname was IHOP. When we lost him, that real hero's funeral, that funeral where that the cancer was not his identity, that he had more heart than scars. The last thing he texted because he couldn't speak because of his trach, he said, enjoy every moment. He wanted to hike the Appalachian Trail, so we had someone do it for him. This is a symbol of victory, not defeat. It's more heart than scars. So we have a battle cry, and I'm going to give you two words, and I think you know what to do. More heart than scars. Thank you.